performances they see at the festival and how there's a way to recharge your creative batteries or be inspired by other people's work at the festival. So Anne, Jeremy, um, I'm just curious about what you have found here in other people's work that has spoken to you as actors. I think the conversation that you had last night was with me. I was, I, I, I was trying to be discreet. I wasn't saying Jeremy told me last night that sounds and, stupid. And, yeah, and, 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 and it was it was something that I had read D. H. Lawrence say that the work of every true artist is the salvation of every other. And I said how saved I feel by by the work that I've seen by people uh, at this festival the last few days. I was sort of um, uplifted and inspired and, 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 and saved. And, and so it's, it's really incredible being here, sharing this. Thank you. Let's talk about it again later. Um, James, I've told this story before, and it happened here many years ago. Danny Boyle had a film called 127 Hours, which was based on the, the climber Aaron Ralston, whose arm was sucked, lost his arm. And Danny worked with Aaron closely. And Aaron would sometimes say to Danny, well, I didn't pull into the left, I pulled into the right, or I was wearing a different jacket when I went that way. And Danny finally said to Aaron, listen, just because something isn't factual doesn't mean it isn't truthful, which I think is a really important line when you're dealing with things that are based on truth and history and biography. So given Danny's idea that you are looking for a truth, even though this film is largely factual, Tell me about how you looked at what was real, what was remembered, and what you might have needed to invent. It's really the biggest challenge you face because uh, I tried to I tried to get it all correct. I mean, I tried to get the pl I did get the plates that we had. I got the chandelier that we had in the dining room. And Anthony Hopkins is wearing my grandfather's hat. We got the Batanti pickles for you. We got <laughs> the same refrigerator that you're trying to fix in Epley, and the same stove, and the same, I mean, it's nuts. I haven't shown the film to my brother yet, with whom I am very, very close. Now, uh, <laughs> my kids said to me, Daddy, what are you going to tell Uncle Ed? He's going to be really pissed off. <laughs> I said, you know, it's, I said, well, what's the problem? It's, it's fine. He's beating me up. That's fine. Dad, he doesn't look very good. So I tried to get it all correct. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, the truth of the matter is, is that there are small changes for narrative reasons. And also, you have to, I think, I mean, I'm alone in this in many respects. I think you have to pay attention to the point of view gods. And I tried very hard not to all of a sudden bring some kind of like 2000, in this case 2019, because it's when I wrote it, 2019 judgment on the characters, or all of a sudden start going off into other areas which didn't relate to my own experience. And maybe that's a, an artistic limitation, but I actually don't think so. I think that you don't go to the cinema or read a book for multiple points of view. I think you go for the artist's point of view. So I had point of view issues and concerns more than whether something was true or not. But your point is well done. I read something that you said before we started working on this that you were interested in breaking down the wall between yourself and your work. Is that, can you talk about that at all? <laughs> he told us to just jump in. I wanted to know, I told Jeremy and Anne, do this, it's more interesting. Yeah, but that had like a fucking Charlie Rose. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, Charlie Rose would interrupt me. I have a great Charlie Rose story. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yes, I did say that, Jeremy. <laughs> Funny you should ask. Uh, well, I, I, I was doing a sort of filmmakers and conversation thing, which I generally loathe because it, the presumption then is that we have some kind of wisdom, which I think is obviously not correct. With Nina Hansen Love, who I, I like personally quite, but this was yesterday. And she said something so great, which of course immediately made me terribly jealous. <laughs> but she said, she said, um, I think part of the problem is that we are, we see so many, we think we have seen so many stories that we think we need to treat the stories in the festival with irony. And I thought, oh, that's really good. Because uh, I believe in, in the power of myth as a storytelling weapon. Now, that doesn't mean you don't subvert it, but in order to subvert it, you have to know it. And uh, I, I, I think that I really hate that iron. So what I meant by that was to try and not be above the material and say, <laughs> look at those idiots. <laughs> but I actually say, we are all idiots, which is a big <laughs> distinction. <laughs> and uh, I think that's the point of, I mean, I've quoted this before, and I could get too sentences, but George Eliot, she said, the thing we owe the artist is the extension of our sympathies. And I, I think today in the culture, there's a kind of a preoccupation with like snark and, you know, because of the, the fact that you boil down the statements now and, and, and twi twittering or tw tweeting, whatever, I don't tweet, whatever the is. And I, I think it's part of that is, doesn't it come from that? Like, I can send you with a tweet, you know, it's like, Fuck you, man. <laughs> Why don't you try to write something that has actually some like, like, like well, sincerity? What's that? It's the commerce of humiliation. Yeah, I, I really can't say. My kids, I, I, I would like eat them. I love them so much. It's so bad. Look at this. And it's like you know, some guy you knows his pants fall down at the bus station, and I understand like you know, slipping on a banana peel. It's like the oldest thing in the world. You think it's funny when somebody else does, but. I mean, it's led to a pretty cruel, angry, discontented world, don't you think? It's like this, you can sort of smell it, right? So this simmering anger, everyone's angry all the time, or greedy, or anger. Well, where does that come from? It comes, not all of it, but some of it, a tiny bit comes from the culture. So I was trying to say, fuck that trend, you know? <laughs> to go against it. Okay. <laughs> We've got a call from everybody who's not live tweeting this conversation. <laughs> now, let me say this, by the way. There actually are people who have mastered the art. My wife is on, um, she has like a Twitter uh, uh, thing, an account for her. And she, she uh, listen, I have to avoid it because if I didn't, I would cry every day, right? You cry more every day. Well, my, my daughter, this is great, my daughter told me that there's apparently this extreme right wing. British politician named James Gray. And apparently, because my daughter is so, you know, 15 and reading every tweet ever, she started reading all these angry, offensive t tweets about me being a scumbag and anti immigrant. I'm like, what are you talking about? Anti immigrant? What are you talking about? Yeah, and they say you're trying to take away rights. I'm like, Georgia, are you sure this is the same James Gray? <laughs> she goes, oh. No, that's a British politician, Dad. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, but it is an art form. Some people can do it. Yes. I'm going to unfortunately take us back to the movie. But we'll talk about <laughs> I thought that was funny. It was funny. <laughs> I want to ask Anne and Jeremy this question. This is a story that is rooted in James's life. And you are actors who are playing people who are rooted in James's life. At what point are they yours? And how do they become yours and no longer James's? My objective was to show it. Meaning what? Meaning, um, it's James's film, and I hoped to contribute to it, and I hoped to show him something that he hadn't considered or seen about Esther. But the idea, I mean, I, I do understand what you're saying, I understand that there is that concept of possessing a character, and it is important. 
but just the language of it, possess, possession and owning, when it's like, how do you want to treat? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't. You maybe you uh, are in possession. It, you're, you're responsible for a piece of land that a tree is on, but it's never yours. And that's sort of the way I feel about these characters that I get to play in this one in particular. Um, it's such a collaborative medium at the end of the day. Um, and I get gleaned so much from, from James Christopher and just the, the script, and, and that was the meeting point of it. But then also, you know, trying to know what the atmosphere of his childhood was like. We, we spoke about it, and I told the story, maybe should I tell it briefly? Yeah. So, um, it's personal story. Um, my dad, during the pandemic, asked me what I wanted for Christmas, and I can get so excited, right, because he was in that club. <laughs> and um, and uh, I said, I want a loaf of bread. And when he sent it to me and it arrived, and I took a bite at first into tears because um, even though I couldn't see my parents, the air that was inside of that bread was in their kitchen. And I remember my mom had been singing and my dad had been talking and they'd been bickering and we're doing okay, we didn't say nice things to each other. I don't know. Um, I wasn't there, but the air was. And, um, and it was a way of being a part of something and being connected through something that um, it's, you know, I'm sure, I don't know, it's inevitable. How do you describe it? You don't, you make films about it. And so I was so reliant upon James for, for that. And also, you know, there's certain things that I know that he doesn't about being a mother um, and being a woman and anger and being around anger. And, um, and so I brought a lot of that too, but it wasn't, for me, it's not like a linear thing and, and uh, clear. <laughs> Jeremy, what about you? And, and also, even though it's sitting right next to me, you can't answer this. Was James willing to share personal memorabilia or things that maybe you wanted or didn't want? Did you get what you needed or did you have to go rogue? You know, honestly, not really. He was, he was, I would get emails saying, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll send you everything, I'll share everything, and then, and then, and then time would go by. And, and, this is true, this is true. Oh, that's so true. It is true. And so I was in, <laughs> I was in Copenhagen and I got on a plane and 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 um, and just sort of sought him out and we spent some time together and I just thought I had to I had to get in there and try and osmose as much as I possibly could because while you know James was incredibly trusting and I think he believed that we could bring our own interpretation uh, based on the text which is incredibly vivid. Um, and just bring our own essence to that. I, I felt that I needed to do more than bring my own essence to that. I needed to know who this man was and who, and who this man was based on. And I needed to know that very specifically and on a, on a cellular level. And so there was a lot of work to be done. And I, and I didn't feel like I was ready to, you know, the night before we started shooting, I sent James an audio text message of a, of a Yiddish camp song that was something that I had learned about in the process. And, and I didn't feel ready to start the movie until... until, 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 until. <laughs> what do you all know me, but he somehow knew my father's Yiddish camp song. Just <laughs> kind of showed up with a tape recorder. And, uh, you notice an inconsistency in the narrative. <laughs> James told me nothing. I, I sang a random Yiddish camp no, song. No, he was incredibly open. You know, we had on the set we had a photograph album on our set. Right, which you never saw, I never showed that to you. <laughs> what else, buddy? Um, so, by the way, I want to, I I just can I extend something for a second? He had me do the Proust questionnaire with my dad, video it, my wife texted it to him. At first you did it as your dad, at Chun Li. Right, right, and you asked me that, then we did it with my dad. So what do you mean I gave you nothing? That's, <laughs> That's what you heard? <laughs> what? Here's the thing. I do want to say one thing. Listen, I do want to say one thing. This is going to turn into a therapy set. No, I do want to say one thing. I'm so glad we can admit it. Uh, <laughs> I do want to say one thing. What Amy said is actually extremely, extremely great. If we take, we take, we, we accept that uh, actors often say, uh, you know, it's a, it's a collaborative process, but in the end, it's James' movie. That is rare for someone like Andy, that stature. 
It is. They're usually not so giving and not so generous. And trust me, I appreciate that more than they could ever know. Because it is a huge gift. And let me say something else, hugely brave. The woman is wearing Susan Robert 1978 <laughs> uh, with all kinds of manner of like unbeautifying uh, you know, creations that we try to push on her. Uh, and, that's and, not true. I asked for it. No, you didn't. No, no, no. <laughs> that's totally true. I got mad that it no, that's totally true. That no, you're absolutely, you're, I admit that. You're, no, you're absolutely, that's absolutely true. You were fantastically generous with me in that respect. Incredible. And I did not mean to imply all words. Absolutely. And that is a hugely generous thing. And you know what? I, it's not an entirely sympathetic character. And I like the ugliness. Because the ugliness is like, you know, I said it to you. It's so not our job to bring to you an uh, excellent advertisement for American capitalism. <laughs> it's our job to try to reveal something, honestly. Since we are talking so much about alternative facts, let's talk about the visits by the Trumps to your school, why it's in the film, and what it meant in terms of framing what the world is like at that time and what the priorities of people are that you are appearing as a young student. Well, I, that I didn't. That's I just to be clear, didn't make up any of that. Um, uh, Fred Trump was the on the board of trustees of my prep school, which um, is depicted, I have to say, with considerable accuracy in the movie. Um, <laughs> my first day there, I, I think he picked me out probably, uh, I mean, obviously there was some anti-Semitism involved, but also I, I did have that attache case. <laughs> I, I'm sure, ridiculous. I mean, and, and didn't look a little preppy, you know. I, there was something off about him, quite clearly. <laughs> and, uh, and he spotted it a mile away. Uh, and, and yes, the Marianne Trump speech. Well, I, my brother and I, I called my brother and I said, Ed, do you remember Marianne Trump's speech at the assembly? He said, oh, of course I do. I said, all right, do me a favor and write down the text that she spoke as well as you could remember it. I'm going to do the same and we'll compare it. And we came up with almost exactly the same text, which leads me to believe what I wrote is pretty accurate about what she's saying. And I love it because it's even as a 12 year old, I remember listening to this woman talk about how she'd overcome such dreadful hardship. In her life. <laughs> and I remember thinking, wow, you're so full of shit. Completely <laughs> out of it. I, I actually remember thinking, wow, you're so out to lunch. I worked hard. <laughs> so uh, I remember that it haunted me because it was a very clear example of, you know, the uh, Ann Richards, the governor of Texas, she said about W, she said, one on third base, thought he did a triple. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you guys don't remember that? I, I wish I'd come up with that one. Uh, that. That was totally the feeling that I got. And I included the Trumps because uh, frankly, a very uh, cinema-nerd reason. Um, I, I was very into Fellini's movie Amarcore, and one of the things I think that makes that film a cut above many other remembrances is the uh, constant reminder of Mussolini's sway over the people in Rimini, and how uh, the, the war is coming, and the, the devastation of Italy is coming, and all of these people are involved in acts of real silliness and folly while this terrible thing is, is there and going to become worse. And the Trumps feel, felt that way to me. I, I, I'm sorry to get all political on you. I don't want to sound like Oliver Stone's brother. But, but I, I did feel a kind of a, a, a slight fight, a fascistic thing in Donald. I mean, he used to parade the halls at that school. He was, by then, he was in his early to mid-30s. And um, he would laugh at the students. Uh, I didn't put that in because it, it, it seemed, then it seemed like a Jeremiah or something. So I didn't include that. Jeremy, so, no, I was just going to say one of the things that struck me when I first read the script was 
you know, this, this incredibly rare thing when you read something that it exists both on a sort of literal and metaphorical level and the, and the incredibly intimate personal story that is at once an epic historical story. And so for me, having that be this sort of uh, uh, adjacent thing that we don't, that he doesn't make a big deal of, but we feel its presence was part of the way that I saw, you know, this is an origin story of an artist, but also the origin story of the political and racial and social divisions that have been widening since these fault lines in 1980. Um, I remember a conversation I had many years ago with Lee Daniels about making Precious, which is based on his life. There's a moment in that film where a character, a young boy, comes out uh, wearing his mother's shoes, and it was something that was based on Lee's life, and he could not watch it as the director of the film. It was so close to him, and it was so horrible a memory that he literally could not direct the scene. He had somebody else shoot it. And I'm wondering, maybe not on that level, but there was a moment in this film where something that had happened in the past, you're behind the lens, and it all comes flooding back, maybe not in a warm and fuzzy way. I mean, there's a lot of that in the movie, I hope. But what, what, I mean, the thing that comes to mind immediately is this scene in the playground, which is, I have to say, extremely accurate to my recollection. Um, my own behavior is um, disgraceful. This is when you can trigger black people. Yes, uh, and it doesn't feel great to this day, and I'm 500 years old, and uh, I tried to recreate it as honestly as I could. But it, I mean, I, was, I, did, I wasn't like Lee, I was there on the set, obviously, watching it, but it didn't feel very good. And you know, there's other stuff, though, in the movie, there's, it's, I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, you think about it, it's, it, it, I went back and we shot this thing 90 feet from my home where I grew up. It's down the block. The only reason we didn't shoot in my home is because the woman wouldn't open the door for us. <laughs> right? Remember, she was very rude. <laughs> and had the minivan, and I saw that we were getting into the minivan, and I wanted to go, oh, please, please. But we did do it, you know, the houses are cookie cut, you know, those semi-attached, immediate post-war Queens houses. And um, I just thought uh, there was some evidence of my living there. There was some uh, paint on the wall for my rockets. And there was an area where my father had put up this gate, which had a regal G in it that was make sure that the garbage cans were protected from all the wildlife in Queens. <laughs> uh, and it, it was there, but it was off its hinges. And you took a photograph of it, which I have as a beautiful picture. But, but not much else. And I started to think that all of those incredibly important dinners that seemed to be of such monumental importance, and grandmother and grandfather and great aunt and uncle and my parents, it was so important. And now there's really no evidence of them ever having lived at all. And you realize the ephemerality of our lives. And that even the places, I mean, this goes to the Proust quote that from the end of Swan's Way, but it's, all of it becomes part of our memory. And it dances around much like fireflies do, you know, at the summer night, it dances in your head. And, and pretty soon it's all gone. And I decided then, when I went back to scout it, that really it should be done like a ghost story, which is why at the end of the film, I needed to have those empty rooms to say, there were all these people here once, but no longer. I don't know if that yeah, made any sense. I, 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 I asked James a question once, because James has been my great teacher. Um, in the world of cinema. Don't you say that, that's a real sign of problems for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually very proud of it, but you can differ in my opinion. So, um, and I asked you one, we, I, I was asking about a film and you said, oh, it's depressing. And I said, what's the difference between when something's depressing and something's sad? And you said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, please correct me if I am, that something that uh, is depressing lacks hope and sadness contains beauty and truth. And I just wanted to, in light of what you just said about going back to your home and your comment earlier about ugliness, I think it's very important to 
celebrate the beauty that exists in ugliness and the opportunity that exists in it and say that um, I don't, that to make ugliness about people's appearances just kind of doesn't feel right um, or truthful to me. And the only thing that can really be ugly is behavior. And the only way that we're going to improve our behavior is if we reveal it. And it was an honor to be a part of your memory. Well, thank you. I, I will say, <laughs> I will say uh, you know, part of that thing, the depressing and sad difference, which is a huge deal for me, um, there's a kind of transcendence, isn't there, that comes from sadness. Uh, depressing, it means it's, it's, it's the sort of elimination of the idea of beauty, which I have to say, weirdly, in this world, or something, it reminds me of this outtake from Apocalypse Now. I don't know if you've ever seen this. It's the greatest thing ever, where Brando is doing the scenes. And I watch him hacking the charms. I'm swallowing the bug friends. It's one of the greatest things ever. Um, that's your point. That's where I'm going to be. No, I just, uh, I, I think that beauty is often mistaken uh, for it to be synonymous with pretty. Uh, beauty is about treating who we are without that irony or superiority and embracing the aspects of us which maybe sometimes are less excellent. And that's okay. You know, that's what the Russian novelists really brought to us. That's what Shakespeare brought to us. You know, it, it, it's interesting that King Lear doesn't just say, uh, I'm, you know, doesn't, he's not just demented or, or whatever. He actually asks a very sick, awful question of his own children, right? That, that he, in, inherent in us is the capacity for such terribleness. But the, the art that is produced needs to acknowledge that with honesty. And if you get rid of that, you don't really have anything. You have a sanitized kind of like, you know, when I remember, and I promise I don't know this, you got, you got oh, 10 seconds. I, when I was a teenager, I went to the Soviet Union, got a student exchange program, and we were made to go to the Bolshoi, and we saw a socialist realist ballet. And it was horrible. It was like all the sort of soul of anything that what it meant to be a person was eliminated because it was all about fealty to the state. So that was anti beauty. And my anti my beauty, no matter how great the dancers were, and they were magnificent, it was fake beauty. Real beauty is acknowledging all sides of the We'll state. be back later for a seminar on beauty and <laughs> truth. <laughs> and <laughs> Thank you so much.